Hey, Matt. Can you guys hear me? Hey, Matt. Hi. Uh, are you going to share that um, PDF file that uh, the thirty percent report that they did? Because mm -hmm. I don't have it in front of me. of you hear me yeah i can hear you thank you i down dick i like the rainbow there i am mm -hmm. do you have the agenda in front of you is that coming through? Um, no, you mean the thing I sent you? Yeah. It's all, just I, all I see is your I It's a typed version of what you sent me. OK. Um, all I have is your screen that shows all of your icons and stuff on it. I'll be back in a sec. Uh. Does that have the agenda on it? Yep. Nothing, you need to do nothing. It's three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> That's my computer. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> you are graced with such a computer. I, I always call the uh, your GPS in your car that talks to you and tells you directions. Uh, <laughs> <you're scratching>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. Turn here. You will. Yes. Yeah. It is. Yeah. No, my, my, my computer is named after Admiral Grace Hopper. Very important person in the computer world. <clears throat> she is the one who designed essentially what became COBOL, which was the ability for one computer to talk to another computer because it couldn't, and they couldn't initially. You couldn't talk to a computer in the next room. My, my original exposure to computer programming was Fortran back in the early 60s. <laughs> uh, and we, should really... we should compare notes, George. Yeah. I was given a handwritten in pencil draft of the first Fortran manual in the late 50s uh -huh. to, to write a program from in IBM. Well, I always remember going down to the computer center and typing out IBM cards and 
turning them in and then coming back the next morning to see if they work. Exactly. <laughs> God. Well, we can get started. Um, sure. How many do we have here? Just us? Let's see. Uh, can you see everybody? Uh, Emily has her own name now. Right oh, but she's not as my <laughs> I'm moving up in the world. <laughs> Good. Emily, hi. Hello, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can you all see who's on the call or should I un I'll stop the share? Oh, there oh no. Hey. Oh, there we go. Well, there's Bob Fonce's house. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that's it. Uh, George put together a little outline. Let me pull that up again. Um, so can you all see that? Oh, no, you can't. Wait, just a sec. I'll get. <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, what I think everyone was viewing as um, the, uh, the main topic for today. Um, our topics for today. And um, George put this together this morning. I just typed it out. Um, we just want to review the uh, discussion and, and make sure we're all on the same page with regard to the wall height, the uh, elevation of the wall. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the wall or pathway around the McKinnon building. Um, I, sent uh, after I met with uh, with Alan and George, I came up with a little diagram on that. I can share that with you. Uh, floodgate options, intermittent openings in the wall to preserve somewhat of a, a, a river view, uh, the design of the wall. You could see that the three items we about last week, uh, stormwater storage, that's the underground storage. If anyone has any further thoughts on that. Um, and then the, I think this is the main focus of this build, uh, meeting. You want the, the park like, the water's edge to look like and underground utilities. And then the follow-up will be the uh, uh, passing along of this information, all those decisions we make to the, uh, the consultants. So, um, and then, yeah, I guess uh, by the last one, George, you meant we need to give Wright Pierce a deadline on giving us some cost estimates. Right. right. Basically, to complete the 30% phase, I mean, that's essentially what they need to do is as soon as we can, as, as reasonable. Um, you know, this this has taken a little bit okay. longer, but we, we, frankly, when we put the proposal together, we took a stab. i will give them three months for the... Uh, 30% phase and they bought into it. And here we are. I think where we ended up, up I think where we ended up on the, uh, the last meeting, let's see, someone wanted to chat. Oh. Okay, Shari, you're on now, all right. And um, yeah, we ended up with the last meeting with a wall elevation of about 13 feet. Um, Wright Pierce and Malone and McBroom were recommending something in the neighborhood of 3.1 to 3.5. Are we, is, is that still our, our target? Just wanted to, I think that's why, what you were looking at, right, George? Yeah, I, you know, they, they sort of ended up as, if we're going to uh, get an approval through FEMA to take the, business district out of the floodplain, I think that's the height it's gotta be. It's just gonna be about five feet above the 
the present bank, which is mm -hmm. not low <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I, everybody pretty much agree that that's uh, what we've got to go for. They I had do. a couple, and that that gets I, us closer. That gets us closer to flea height than we were before, and that's so that's I'm agreeable with that. Um, I think uh, Matt and I have talked. You know, the the reality is going to come when they get the cost estimates together. Yep. Because uh, Matt quickly before the meeting or this morning, I can't remember when it was, put, put together the, the costs that we've got incurred to date on the restroom and the sewer. And that, that comes out of this project costs. And just to see what we've got left, I think it's like 2.4 million, which has got to include the parking lot you know, improvements, which we had scheduled for about a million. So we're about a million and a half for the flood resiliency, which is not far off from what thought it was going to be out of the really rough cost. George, uh, you said there's a, a, a roughly 1.4 million available for the flood improvements? Well, I think, I think you, you said, Matt, that there's 2.4 if you take out the sewer and the restroom. Um, yeah, really, really rough. I'm, uh, last night I was working on a uh, projection uh, of all the expenditures that we have and the, the revenues. And I will put together a, a large spreadsheet on this, but all told uh, at this point, we're looking at about 2.4 million that we could put into construction. And I've taken out uh, the engineering, the construction management and everything. This is what we'd be looking at for, for construction alone for the flood resiliency, the uh, drainage system, the repaving, the park, uh, the pedestrian walkways. Yeah, that's, I think. That's hey, could I just reach out for a little clarity here? I heard George mm -hmm. say 1.4, I hear you saying 2.4. I, I was taking a million out of that 2.4 for the parking lot. Uh, so that leaves 1.4 for the flood resiliency part of it. But again, Matt, Matt had, Matt's 2.4 was just construction without um, fine fees and so forth. So you'd have to a little more fine tune. I think he's probably pretty close to to what we've got. Uh, so. yeah. All right, gonna move right along here. Let me show you the, okay, can you see this all right? Uh, yep. It's, what I, what I did is I took the, the graphic that Wright Pierce and Malone McBroom had and I uh, zoomed in a little bit and uh, drew along the green line, the green dash line that was there previously to show an idea of what the, what the wall would like, the extension of the wall would look like around the Narragansett building, Allen's building. And uh, this includes um, this would um, assume that Alan's going to give us an easement, give the town an easement for a walkway behind his building for um, uh, purposes of uh, perspective. Right here is where the, the uh, temporary garage is right now. So that would be gone. And then there's some brush and stuff around here, kind of a temporary path that some folks use to cut over but we would make that an asphalt path. And then the wall here, I know that this has to be as, as ornate or as uh, aesthetically pleasing as the, the wall that's uh, oh, on the harbor uh, frontage, but there would be a wall here. And then um, a wall up against uh, Allen's building here. I don't think, we can get funding for waterproofing Allen's building. So we'd have to have a separate structure here. 
And I talked to the owner of Schooner's Landing, Scott Folsom, on Friday. And he's, he's certainly open to giving us an ease for what we would need here and you know what we would need here. Of course, it's to his benefit to have this walkway right here. The, I, I see this as a significant uh, benefit from the town standpoint in that will reduce the pedestrian traffic here into this driveway around, yeah, Allen's Bullards are right there. So. Um, may, if may, I ask a, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, is there, could, is it possible to make this uh, from the point, the town's point of view, the pedestrian entrance to the parking lot from this end of town. When we were discussing this the other day, people, we were noting that there's a congestion here with pedestrians and traffic. And it seems to me this is an opportunity to at least look at the possibility of making this a, a signed and main entrance to the parking lot for pedestrians and make this a non-pedestrian entrance to the parking lot. I do not know what problems that might create otherwise, but I just want to raise it as a possibility. I think that is a possibility. Uh, the others of you can chime in, but um, um, Scott is willing to allow us or give us an easement here, but he, his main concern is that he has to bring in his, his floats for his, uh, you know, his wharf and, and such down here. So he has to bring his floats in here each year. He no longer stores them down here. So he needs room to do that. So we don't want to have too much in the way of obstructions here. The, the more important thing is to have two of Chip's boats in there to store for the winter, <laughs> which is probably even, you know, more problematic than his floats. I see, I see a bit of a problem myself. Um, if it's for pedestrian traffic, um, unless there's a style over the wall down on that corner where the circle three is, they're going to have to walk out to Main Street to get back around into uh, Schooner Landing. So they'll be traveling the same distance as if they just went out the current driveway. Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the, uh, Barnaby, there would be a gate at the west end of that, of Allen's building there, because the, uh, the wall would go up along his his building. So there'd be a, a gate there so you could walk directly out into uh, his um, parking area. The gate would be where? Uh, right, right there. there right? Or, can you, yeah. can you see my pointer? Yeah, right there. But the wall will continue on the dash line all the way out to the street, won't it? No. No, that, that'll be gone. It'll be pushed up to the uh, My building. concept here is for the wall. Go ahead. Well, so what, my concept here was for the wall to be adjacent to the side of Allen's building so that we don't uh, uh, impact the opening for, or don't affect the opening for um, for Schooner's Landing. Because oh, yeah, he parks, he parks, he allows parking of cars right here now. And if we put a wall, they would take that away. But how plus, would... plus it, it will obstruct the entrance into the... Uh into the uh, parking area too. How, how adjacent to the building are we talking? I mean, you're gonna work on your building. It's a wooden now, building. Alan, Alan owns about 12 inches of land there, I think, 10, 12 inches, right, Alan? That's right. I've got a question if I could. <clears throat> so where you are adjacent to the, what we're talking about with the, the wall is gonna be very close to the side of the building. <clears throat> You're, you're actually constructing a wall rather than flood proofing the side up to the necessary elevation. Is that correct? That, that's, uh, that's one option. Flood proofing is a, going to be a lot less expensive. Well, uh, as, as Matt said, it would, that would be something that wouldn't be covered by EDA, mm -hmm. but probably might be the better, better option though. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I have a follow up question then. <clears throat> So if, if you look on the bottom where you're constructing that, the wall, 
I mean, from a presentation we saw last week, constructing a wall in order to be able to hold back flood waters, that's quite an undertaking. Uh, requires a foundation. Uh, well, you saw, I don't have to repeat all the work that would be involved. <clears throat> and that excavation as compared to all the other excavation, wall excavations we're talking about, is in a tight area close to the building. Mm -hmm. So my question is, <clears throat> rather than put the wall there, what if you flood proof that side of the building too and have a gate have a floodgate between the end of the wall and that four or five feet to the back wall of the building, flood proof that, flood proof the side, and do it that way. And just have a, a walkway going along the edge of the gulch. Yeah, we could still build a walkway, which I think is a terrific idea, but <clears throat> it seems to me that if you're getting into the kind of construction that they were talking about last time, you know, driving piles and whatever else you're going to do that close to the building, uh, that would be expensive and might be problematic. And, and, and there is a there is a, uh, a concrete foundation there now, although, Alan, is that open on the south side? No, well, it's not, it, technically it's not a foundation. It sits on the fill. Okay. What we did was fill in the gulch with the building raised several feet in the air. Uh -huh. And we set a 16 inch thick perimeter wall with stringers inside. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just yeah. sits on the fill. In other words, we're floating. So it doesn't go down into the ground. Uh, so so oh, sorry. And there are, there are three openings in the back left over from yeah. where this, the I-beams be. were that, that, that yeah. where they pulled them out. If we My close impression. those off, would that be a problem? Or you? Not really. We, we have trap doors inside to get under there. Okay. Haas, your hand was up a little while ago. Yeah, I, I butted in and said what I wanted to say then. But anyway, what from my recollections now, and my memory is getting worse as I go older, but in earlier conversations, I had the impression that we really needed to put a wall around this building if we wanted the flood wall to work because um, the building is, is, is basically floating. And uh, if, we, if we get serious uh, sea rise, it's going to have a lifting effect on that building, float, trying to float it. I doubt that it would lift. When Roland Bragg jacked our building in the air, it wouldn't go up. He had to use two systems. Uh, Pete and then Dick. Uh, this is just for, for consideration. I, I, of course, don't speak for DEP, but one of the standards that is going to be reviewed as part of this project, and this will all be flushed out, I guess, more in the pre-application conference, but I want to plant the seed now, um, is that there's a standard in the Natural Resources Protection Act that's going to fall into place here, probably, where um, you can't, and the language is a little bit I'm not, I'm not going to get the language right, but it says you can't unreasonably impact the flood hazard for adjacent properties. So just for consideration is, is one of the things that's going to have to be looked at as part of this process is to minimize flood hazard to adjacent properties. So wherever the wall stops or gets extended to, there's going to have to be an analysis of what is going to be the impact now with the new configuration on flooding of adjacent properties. So in this case, if the wall stopped where the, before you put in the green dashed lines, it would be what happens to Allen's property. If it continues around Allen's property, then the consideration is gonna be, well, does it, in, how much does it increase the flood hazard onto schooner landing and stuff like that? So I just wanna make sure that as part of these discussions that that's a realization that's gonna have to be um, mm -hmm. uh, dealt yeah, with and as we work through this process. And when I talked to the adjacent property owner on uh, Friday, uh, he had the same concern. He's brought that up before, that there, he wants to be sure that there is no impact onto Schooner's Landing from the modifications or the, the infrastructure that we put in uh, for the wall for flood resiliency. So definitely we need to take that into account, not just how, his property, but all. How far, how far does this go, Peter? I, um, in terms of 
if we're doing this on this side of Main Street, are the properties on the other side of Main Street going to be able to raise this issue? I, I don't know the answer to that, Haas. Um, it's it typically is like an adjacent property, but honestly, I, I really don't know the answer to that. It's probably looked at at a case by case basis. I'm just thinking about some of the seawall projects that I've been involved with um, where, for instance, the consultant for the applicant had to do some like modeling or at least some design work to show how they've minimized end effect impact basically is what it's called. It's, it's not only in dune areas, it's erosion in built up areas, it's flooding usually. Um, so, so there's, in this case, it probably would be erosion, but I, I or uh, flooding. I, I don't know how far they would want to look. I don't think it would be more than a property or two, unless it made sense to, you know, look on a bigger scale. Well, all I'm thinking is, we, we've just been going merrily along our way, not concerned about the back door, or the other side of the peninsula that Main Street is on. And there's maybe one chance in a hundred that what you're saying could force us to have to look at that. And that's all I wanted to question I wanted to raise. I want to add that the uh, uh, the consultants are one of the uh, work tasks is for them to model the potential impact of a flood wall on adjacent properties. All right. Uh, Dick. Um, yeah, I just want to back up quickly for uh, an observation about uh, the town putting up signage to direct uh, direct pedestrians down along the the west side of Allen's building. Uh, we want to be cognizant of legal issues of of the the town directing pedestrians down a, a private property. Um, AD issue ADA issues. It's not uh, it's not a finished. Mm -hmm. A finished walk in in any way, um, uh, unrestricted traffic, un, uncontrolled traffic. So we just want to be mindful before we go in that direction. That it's got mm -hmm. legal ramifications. Yeah. I was only Dick. I was only suggesting that because of the the pedestrian problems that people we have always been raised with respect to the yep. other the traffic entryway. Entryway. Yeah. I I I I understand. I, and I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just yeah. saying, on, on, you know, when you when you do it, be aware of of what can of worms gets opened up. So, can I, can I ask you a question? Um, um, just refresh me a little bit. Are the dashed lines on that property lines? Because I thought that they represented wall. They they did they did represent wall. Yeah, this was the. So the dashed lines are the wall. Not not now. It's, yeah, this it's, is Matt's revision. It's, to changed. Their it's yeah. changed. The yellow line is the wall. Um, well, yeah, the yellow line would either be the wall or flood proofing. I see. So, um, OK. But the dash, the big dash line is the property line, isn't it? No. That's no, not. No, the property line is almost right on top of the, the wall there. Okay. It's uh, I think Alan was it was like 10 inches it's, from so, the wall. So right. basically the dash line either east or west side of Alan's building represents wall possibilities. Yes. Yeah. All right. That's a nice shot. One, one comment I could make on on the, the thought of that sidewalk and stuff coming down along the building. People coming from the east side down Main Street are still going to come down the alley. They're certainly not going to pass, come down and come back into the parking lot. Uh, so the reality of people actually using that, to, you know, maybe people coming from Newcastle side across the bridge that's assuming there's no cars yeah. parked. Yeah. George is right. Plus, the fish market and the butcher shop customers all come from the parking lot and do they could and right. use the alley. 
I mean, it's a good idea to try to free up that alleyway from pedestrians, but I think as a reality, it probably won't ever happen. Uh, certainly, the right. one connecting in the back of your building connecting with the uh, owner will be very much used. Uh, it would reduce the, conge the congestion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, So this, um, in response to Barnaby's question, yeah, this is this is what um, Wright Pierce gave us last week. So this was the idea for their wall. This green line that that didn't take into the account the fact that we're we're blocking. The, uh, the parking, the use of parking spaces and this driveway for Schooner. Yeah, if, if you want to you get go back, out to the, go ahead. Get back yeah. to the, the comment I made before. I don't think we can give the consultant enough direction on this. I, I, obviously, we have to have flood protection in that location, but <clears throat> I would like to know whether, how they how would they construct a, a wall in the location shown uh, to well, which would be the bottom as I'm looking at the uh, at the uh, picture <clears throat> uh, in the location they're they're showing. I, how much construction is that? What risk is there to the uh, to the building uh, versus as I was mentioning before, flood proofing the building itself up to the uh, required elevation? That, that right. ultimately may be the better way to. Uh, uh, well, flood proof in here. Yeah. There's, there's the other question that if it's sometime in the future, we want to raise the height of the wall from 13 feet to 14 plus feet. How do you do it that corner? Because the 14 plus feet is over right below the bridge and would have to shut off the entry now to um, sc the schooner area. So there's that, that question looking forward. If you're going to be able to raise the wall to 14 plus feet, what happens in that corner is also key in that corner because that, that's where it meets the highway elevation that determines what flea height is. I might suggest if you're actually flood proofing the building, you're going to be probably taking siding off and running, you know, uh, membrane material up the sheathing and then put the siding back on. So if you're going to do that, probably behoove you to take it up to elevation 15 or something or something like that higher than so you don't have to tear it apart again. Makes sense. Okay. But I, I, I think the reality here as far as giving them, uh, you know, I think probably the either the wall along the south one and flood proofing up the west side, or as Bob was suggesting, flood proof around the both sides and not actually have a seawall there. Um, you know, you can sort of give them the opportunity of considering that. This is just a 30%. They'll probably just end up throwing a number in there that, that would be somewhat representative of a cost. It's not going to be an insignificant cost. Uh, and exactly how they work out the the elevation 13.1 coming down the main street uh, and connecting over to northwest corner of Allen's building remains to be seen too. Yeah, this is this is a little bit of a challenge here, right in here, because you're going to have to raise the sidewalk or have a wall here. Right. Adjacent tree. Okay, so is is the consensus view that we should have either the wall or waterproofing around here uh, to include this basically in the flood uh, flood protection project? Essentially, is mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Right. I mean, certainly yes. the flood proofing option will be a whole lot less expensive than the seawall. 
but we need we need to say in there that we need to look forward to what how how that will then be raised to 14 and a half feet or whatever it is if we go to fleet height in the future mm -hmm. that, and that that's what makes that i think i think keeping that in mind is going to lead to the ultimate solution a resolution of how we have to do that okay i guess i guess um the the one thing that we really haven't talked about but they're presenting this 13.1 as being the solution that'll take you to 2050, which is all that they're really being hired to do. Um, the question is, do we design that wall so it can be added to? I mean, that's gonna get really high. Uh, or when it gets up to that point, you just accept, you know, water coming over it from here and there, not very often. But, uh, Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, I've got a thought that might not be very helpful, but Jonas Salk, who invented polio vaccine, he posed the question, are we being good ancestors? And uh, which I've never forgotten because it's a good question to ask ourselves. I mean, 2050 is only 30 years from now, and I'm not probably going to make it another 30 years, but um, it's not that far away. And I kind of think we ought to, you know, go the whole distance. I don't kind of think that. I do think that. Well, in support, Barnaby, the two, using the number 2050 with related to any height, uh, I, I would greatly hesitate to do because um, I've seen how fast things are melting in Greenland and Antarctica. And the sea rise is, com is coming at us much faster than we think it is. So I wouldn't try to, I wouldn't say that it's a 30 year. I think we'll be lucky if it's 20 years. So I'm, I'm a pessimist in that point of view. Well, you could very well be right. My point is I'm trying to look at a longer range picture. Yep. And I haven't been to Greenland myself, but I look at these, these uh, websites all the time showing all the calving glaciers and all the rest of it, both the Antarctic and Greenland. I agree with you. I've lost track of what the question is on the table here. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Barnaby suggesting that we, and Haas is kind of echoing it, that we look at a higher elevation than than 13. Um, I just don't see where that's possible now. No, well, I'm not arguing it for now, Matt. I'm just saying, let's be prepared to move. We've, we've sort of talked about be, be, being able to move there in 20 or, well, we've said maybe 30 years, but I think it may be 20 that we have to look at it. And that's no. all I'm saying. I don't, I, I'm happy with 13 feet or 13 plus a couple inches, whatever it turns out to be for the, t for the time being in terms of the costs. Okay. Let's move on to, uh, to floodgates. So did we make a decision there? Well, I, I did hear, I think I heard a consensus by, by uh, a silence, maybe, maybe I just need to. Yeah, well, after I spouted it. off, apparently um, yep. the, comment, the comment was made that um, we can't go there anyhow, so I should have saved some spit. Well, I don't, um, we can discuss that further if you'd like, but uh, <laughs> I guess the, what, what I want to, to uh, the consultants uh, conversation we just had is that we, whether it by it be by waterproofing the building or uh, a seawall, an extension seawall, or a combination of both, we want to include the uh, Narragansett leather building in the in the plans. I, I move section. that we follow the yellow line on that most recent document, opting for waterproofing the building. I would second that. 
I would like to to uh, throw it at the engineers to see whether the wall or the waterproofing would be better. Well, yeah, they they should definitely weigh in on that. Um, well, if we're going to have the engineers' input, and I'd like good engineers' yeah. input on on putting uh, putting the seawall around the building, because I've seen piles driven within three feet of existing buildings with no harm done to the existing building. Now I don't know what the costs associated with that are, but uh, I, let's really let's look at the the actual cost differential of putting the seawall around there. And it would be closer than three feet. Mm -hmm. Alan, what what is your preference here? It's your building. What would I, you like to see happen in the best of all possible worlds? Uh, probably a wall, but I'm not. Sh I'd, I'd have I'd listen to the engineers about how close you can put a, a pile-driven wall to the building. Again, we only own. 10 to 12 inches. So if it were out a little further, it would have to be on schooner property. And and, and we haven't, we actually haven't taken any borings in that vicinity there. Uh, you know, you know, all that's fill for sure. And how deep you actually have to go. It may be a different situation building that wall there than it is at the uh, uh, rest of the park in the uh, parking lot. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, Sherry has her Shari. hand up. Shari. Hi, um, Alan, if we put a wall up um, on the west side, do you lose a lot of view that you care about? No. Yay. OK. OK, well, I think I'm still hearing the same um, that we we put either the wall, um, the waterproofing, or a combination of both here. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Give it to the engineers to. Yeah. Consider. All right. And then the uh, the floodgate options. So I don't know if there was a good slide on that or not. I don't think they did that tell you I don't remember um, I mean the what what was discussed was a sort of a combination of uh, these storm panels or of swinging doors at the launching ramp and then uh, on the smaller openings into the park probably some sort of a, a swing or arrangement Any thoughts on that? Well, isn't the, aren't the alternatives either a passive or an active system? The active system is one that's either going to be hydraulically or electrically driven, where the passive system is going to be a, a gate that uh, probably a swinging gate. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the, well, the direction we give the engineers is, uh, which one of those do you want the Active. There it is, right there. Isn't that that green gate there? Isn't that what we talked about the other day? That would be I that think one of the options. That's a. That would be one of them. Yep. That is that a passive one swinging gate? Well, it's something that you have to do by hand. I don't think right. it does it. So that's. I think that uh, that's the direction we give the engineers. Which one do you want, active or passive? I would say the one that uh, requires human intervention because anything automatic, I don't, I think we've sort of come to the conclusion that that's not a practical thing in, in this kind of climate. Yeah, I agree. Climate, plowing, sand, yeah. yeah. And, and until we know exactly where it is and how it's being used, there, I don't think we're ready to, to make that decision. Make what decision? Uh, what what kind of gate we're going to have? Well, yeah, uh, whether, but I, I think the, the basic concept of active or passive, I think we can give direction to them on that because that's a big deal. Yeah, I I I vote passive. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, because I think they they in their estimate, if you were going to have one of those uh, float up, you know, barriers, I think they had like two hundred and fifty thousand in there for that. And they weren't they weren't thrilled. No. no. Who would be responsible for closing the gate? Man. <laughs> yeah. I, say, Carol. I sense retirement Carol. coming up very quickly. <laughs> Fire department or public works, whatever. I assume that we're going to end up with a uh, uh, emergency response plan that'll be worked out. Yeah. Uh, and so it'll be a, a town employee, someone, some department that's available 24 hours. I think you can pretty much guarantee that someone will go shut it. Right. I like the idea of the fire department. Yeah, right now the fire department's putting out the sandbags for us. So uh, they'd probably be the first ones to get the call. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we had it today, I'd have uh, both uh, public works and the fire department and probably the police department all have keys. You know, we'd, it ha they'd have to be locked open just so nobody would shut them when they weren't supposed to be shut. So. Um, I mean, one thing that you can have is like an ox box that, that is on the wall that if you've mm -hmm. got the key to open it, it has a key in it. So you somebody isn't carrying around those keys with them. All right. We know how those gates are sealed at ground level. It's not sandbags. <laughs> well, you're going you're gonna to have a, quite, a, quite a lot of water squirting in underneath there. There must be some kind of a gasket system. Right, so I would think that would be a gasket system down there. Well, yeah. but also you're going to have to maintain that pavement. If, the, for example, that's the boat ramp. Yes. You're going to have constant wear and tear on that pavement, and you're going to ha have hollowing. So you, I don't know what to do about the repair of that, so it's a, so it meets the gaskets. I, I think they probably have some type of uh, strip down here, like you have on your door. You know that goes mm -hmm. the length of this that it seals properly because you're also you're also assuming that the pavement isn't going to heave in the wintertime when it's frozen and and you can't get the gates no. shut that's right uh, well, that'll be something for uh, another annual checkup yeah to your points to george's point we you know no one in this so far we no one said what does salt water do to this or, or what does freezing and thawing over 20 winters do to it? Again, to me, that would be just the, the annual checkup and repairs and maintenance done as needed, just like everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we should just vote for the green gate and move forward. Yeah. Uh, and then it's either a combination of that and then on the smaller openings, uh, some either swing doors or things like that. In any case, it'd be something that's easily done and not having to be carry a bunch of panels 500 feet to, to do things. So uh, I'll, I'll vote for passive and ask the engineers what they like. Yep. OK, they gave us they gave us that picture of the green. So it may well be that that's what they like. But or okay. if not necessarily what they like, what's going to be most effective? Is well, I'm, I'm assuming that that would affect their liking or disliking. But we, yeah, OK, we is prefer that, the I, I, I'll tell them we prefer the passive uh, passive. And what do they think works best? Is it passive yeah. or active? I thought the passive one was the one where active where... active means that someone has to go out there and Open All right. It Let's out. not confuse our terms then, because that's so, not the way it was presented to me. So it is active, correct? Yes. I want the kind that somebody that Cheryl's got to go down and do. Yeah, I would think that would be called active. What do I know? I know. I, I, I would agree. agree with Barnaby on that. That's correct. If you need a person that's pa to, to operate it. It's, it should be considered passive. Okay, humanly active, operated. Active. <laughs> yeah. Humanly Manual. operated gate. Manual versus automatic. 
Right. There you go. Right. Thank you, Peter. Hey, that's a that's an engineer. And that's why Peter's on the right. call. Oh, good man. So, Dick, was your suggestion that it be manually uh, operated? Manually operated. Okay, I'm glad. That All right, clear. and the and specifics to be presented by the engineer. Okay. Now, I want to know if that's sexist. Shouldn't it be womanly operated? Yeah, <laughs> uh, we'd have to send Matt instead of Cheryl. Um, okay, and, and then the big question was with with that issue: Would a manually manually operated uh, system meet the criteria for FEMA? I I, I think the uh, engineers thought that it would. From, I think they said, yeah, they, I think they said rather than actually, I think they said it the other way. I heard them say that the uh, the the uh, automatically operated would not. That FEMA no, didn't I, I like think, the idea of one of those hydraulic lift things. OK. Right. And I think as long as you can ask them again, a positive plan that works, that's, that's yep. really the key. Yeah. OK. Preference. OK. And then the. Uh, the number of openings in the wall or or how we want one of those or what 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 are your thoughts on that so we're talking about this area here are you talking about path uh, gateways into the park at this yeah. point yeah um certainly in the middle there is the main one and certainly one at each end um and, and i would stop there i think that's plenty yeah, yeah. i think that's plenty yeah i agree yeah. Uh, don't over don't overlook the entrance uh, at the corner of Allen's building. Oh right, right. Oh, the one on the on the east end. Can't you simply walk around the end of the wall, which presumably be kind of shallowing out as you go up the street there, up uphill. Yeah. Yeah, it'll die out into the hillside. Mm -hmm. Do we, do we have the property, to, the land to do that? Oh. Uh, that, oh would be, that, that would be a simple solution, removes one gate. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where the property lines are. Well, I think that's a question we should know the answer to. We're, yeah. we're going to, we, I've, I've talked to uh, the owner of Savory, Maine, and she is agreeable to uh, giving the town, well, selling the town, whatever, transferring the, <laughs> the, to the town, this land for a five foot sidewalk here. Going up, goes up to Water Street. I don't know what the access, you know, point here would be. I think for the purpose of what I'll we're have... doing, I think we should assume there's going to be a gate there. And if we do it easier, you know, when it comes down to that, we ought to do it. Okay. Well, the, the sidewalk could go into it too, though. If the sidewalk coming down went into the park as well as into the parking lot just smoothly, that would be, that would be, from my point of view, more elegant. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I agree. One, two gates, and then over here, if we could get away without a gate, yep. we would just have an entrance there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, design options for the wall face. Oh, before we get on to that, Matt, the the intermittent openings, actually what I was talking about was um, actually incorporating in the wall uh, some openings that are maybe 15 feet wide and, and brings the wall down to three feet along the wall just to give people a view out into the uh, river better that would have a swinging, you know, door that closed it off when it needed to be. Um, that oh, is actually, yeah. if you, um, one of these slides on the waterfront concept, I think, has a sketch that I had done, sent it to Jason. And it, it, it illustrates something like that. And I think it was labeled with some uh, translucent, you know, glass. But, the case we're not going to do any there it is yeah see that over over there little uh, cutouts in the wall yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Right. As you designed those doors, they were glass. Now, do I, they I did, I because we were always talking about glass. Yeah. When mm -hmm. we added stuff, we we're talking about glass, but I think uh, the idea of having no glass was just a flood door. But do, do they hinge down toward the river or toward the parking lot? <clears throat> I was thinking uh, towards the towards the river. I'm thinking, and it's just sort of permanently there. You can you can put some artwork on it or whatever you want to do. Uh, could be determined, but that, that was my concept. If they were on the water side, the water pressure would help keep them shut. <laughs> yeah, right. When George first uh, thought of that, and he presented that drawing with the arch and everything. I was quite enthused because simultaneously on my own, I had thinking about a way to see through the wall and instead of those openings at the top of the wall, I don't know if I drew in those long rectangles in the middle of the wall or George did, I guess George did, but I can see something it wouldn't have to be quite that high or that wide, but just window glimpses through the wall, the length of it, just permanent ones. But that that um, isn't helping with, um, with the overall height that is bothersome to some. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to see over the wall if we get up to that 13.1 level, but um, oh. you'd, be, you'd be able to see that there's something enticing on the other side because you'd be seeing through it at regular intervals. I don't know what the intervals would be every 10 feet, every 20 feet, mm -hmm. something like that. I'll, kind, of, kind of a nice look. I'll add that to our notes. Uh, okay. I want to hear what Peter says. He's had his hand up. Yeah, Peter and then Shari. Uh, just, just, just a thought, um, you know, on, on the, on the waterfront concept design, there's, kind of two openings uh, down over by the boat ramp. Um, one at the boat ramp where there's going to be a gate uh, and then one a little bit closer, you know, to the, to the parking lot where kind of existing access is. And I'm just wondering if um, consideration might be given in kind of altering the design so that you just have access at the near where the boat ramp gate is going to be, um, or if that doesn't make sense. Uh, that way you're kind of limiting the number of access points or the number of gates you have to have. Um, and then kind of an off, two off thoughts I had for the waterfront concept were, while I have the floor here, were uh, instead of using pea gravel, which is kind of, and I know this is getting a little bit, maybe a little bit too picky, but instead of using pea gravel, which is what they're specking right now, why it would make a lot of sense to use crushed oyster shell. Um, hmm. Because I mean, you know, Damariscotta River oysters is a pretty famous thing, and there's probably a lot of oyster shell somewhere to use for that. Probably could be low cost and locally sourced. And then the only other thought I had is, um, in the and this would probably be developed further as the concept goes on, but integrating a little bit more of the living shorelines concept uh, into the waterfront concept number one, which would use kind of native plant plant and vegetation uh, in terms of grasses and shrubs. Um, we have a whole bunch of, uh, we have a planting guide, I guess, that we can share with Wright Pierce. Um, they're probably already aware of it, but that might help kind of keep, you know, keep native, native vegetation and stuff in there. Um, and then maybe restoring a little bit of a marsh on the edge there, if, if that's something mm -hmm. that's called for. So those are a couple thoughts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Well, regarding the single entrance, I think we discussed that some time back. There are some people around who have trouble walking. I'm one of them. And uh, to have to go way down the end to get around that wall and find yourself midpoint under a tree or something would be discouraging, let's put it that way. Um, I think it, Plus, you've got that entrance zigzagging through the parking lot from Taco Alley aimed toward the gate. Um, well, maybe maybe uh, we have to change all of our thinking in that regard. What are you saying, Barnaby? Uh, Shari? Well, I, I I'm think... Think... Oh, I'm thinking ahead. that uh, going back to the windows and the wall, mm -hmm. never a big fan of those. Uh, the windows will get dirty. 
they'll get muddy, they'll get scratched, they'll have bird droppings, et cetera. I just think the maintenance on them will be too significant uh, or infrequent. And I just don't see the options to them. So that's my sense. Well, when Bob first suggested the glass wall, I didn't like the sounds of it myself, but once I thought of these smaller panels, if they happen to be two feet high, you can get a 24 inch squeegee and have a squirt bottle on one hand and just go walking down the line, squeegee it, get on the other side of the wall and squeegee your way back. And yeah, but who's really gonna be doing it on a regular basis? I might, I don't know. <laughs> well, you said you weren't gonna be around till 2050, so, but I'm just saying, especially summertime. Just a thought. We get a lot of fur droppings. Yeah. So that's another thing, and the birds don't poop sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, well, I clean up green. more than enough things off the side of my car. Oh, all right. And uh, I live near Miles Hospital, so I'm just saying there's a plethora of opportunities. But that's just I... my sense. I don't really see the need for the glass. Uh, Gonna walk around and go sit in the park. You don't need the glass windows or a two-second view. That's my input. Okay. So if I interpret Sherry's comment one way, it would be that Miles Hospital attracts bird droppings. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. <laughs> uh, just if I could make a comment, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about an awful lot of work. Uh, you got a lot of gates. Now we're talking about uh, having these drop down, um, uh, whatever panels um, at, um, at, at those viewing areas. <clears throat> I would, uh, I, I, I think we should, you know, strive to make this as uh, standalone as possible and then uh, have intervention interventions where necessary uh, you know I, I suggested those those glass panels and if you don't like those so be it but uh, to have now four or five additional areas for viewing with these drop down panels uh, is and then in addition to the the boat ramp the main entrance and other and the entrance up at the uh, at the um, northern side of the gate is just, that's it, an awful lot of work. And I'm not sure how FEMA is gonna be looking at this. I mean, is it, is it something that will end up providing guaranteed flood protection uh, or not? Okay, let's see. Yeah. So how many, how many points should we um, limit ourselves to? Like three, the main gate there, the launch ramp, and the one over by Allen's building. That would be three. Yeah. And yeah. I, agree, I don't yeah. like the hinge down idea personally. Okay, Allen and then Haas. Okay, um, as far as windows go, it's a no for all the reasons that already said. Entrances, I think one at each end and one in the middle is very important. Having lived and worked downtown for over 40 years, I've watched people use the, the, uh, that whole strip. They come from the back of Rennie's to have a cigarette. Uh, the workers do, the employees do. People from Ice Cream on Main Street come through. You gotta have that middle opening. And of course that makes four gates. If, if the one at the east end is a gate, that makes four totally, if you count the one at my building. Okay, well we're promoting no smoking. Uh, and it's also can't. a town ordinance now. Well, so. Okay, I could care less about whether they smoke or not. They still go out there. Well, I, I know, but I do care. And pollution... No, no, no not the smoke. They go there anyway. Leave the smoking pot out of it. <laughs> no! So well, I'm not even... That doesn't supposed matter to be to putting signs up and encouraging no smoking okay. on town I'm, property. I'm sorry I brought up smoking. It doesn't, that, that's not my point. It's the middle entrance is extremely important. And the one at each end is important. Yeah. Plus the one at my building. 
I, I agree with you, Alan. I think the one on the east side, we might be able to ramp our way up out of there and not have a gate. Right, we can save a buck if we don't need one there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Haas, go ahead. Well, okay. If we don't, we, I think at the east side, we, we, we do something aesthetically pleasing if it just flows in without a gate there, if it just goes up the hill. I think that makes it, makes it feel natural, like it was almost always there. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would like us to move to the way we want the park to look, because I think the wall and the gates are going to be minor compared to the impact of that park and being able to be in that space and what that space looks like and how it feels and how the access feels. I think people are going to be oblivious to the wall and the gate if that's done right. So I would want to focus our attention, move our attention to how we want that park to look. Okay. Well, let's um, let's just quickly talk about the wall face because I think it was it was thought that the uh, just from the comments I think Mike Hers made these that uh, the wall the wood you know probably would weather quicker. Uh, so either an imprinted panel or a stone face would. I think we want it to look permanent. I think a stone, as I suggested, that that foundation under the Watson building over at Miles is pretty attractive. George and I have talked about that. And uh, that would be a really handsome wall. And okay. uh, the idea one of them had about having this sort of generic um, design sailboats and things on the facing of that wall. I didn't like the sounds of that at all. I think just natural stone would be nice. And I've got some other ideas to make things exciting, but we'll move on to that later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if I could just uh, comment that uh, <clears throat> if there's such thing as a dam or scott of brick uh, that many of these buildings are constructed of, it would also be nice to see a wall that uh, reflects that uh, that type of brick. A brick wall is good for sea walls. A lot of mortar joints. And you know, not an insignificant cost, but I think I think you definitely need to have an attractive face on that that's not just concrete. Um, yeah. Probably all agree with that. Um, exactly what we decide, uh, they could cost out a couple of different options on a per foot basis. And uh, you know, when this when this moves into the next phase, we can get more serious about it. What about using the brick only at the center arch? That's that's probably not a bad thing. You definitely definitely want to make something at that at that archway. Anyways, to uh, stormwater storage, I don't think there's a lot to talk about there. It, it, you know, I, we I hear Wright Pierce's idea in regard to some type of under pavement mm -hmm. stormwater storage, right? I, I like I like that better than the than a, a mechanical system, a pump system, if it's possible. Yeah, I, I just a passive system like that, if they can do it reasonably expensively. If you have to rely on pumps, you've got to, if you don't have power, you know, there's all kinds of different issues with that. Um, if you can avoid that, I think you're better, better off. My father always used the phrase, he always used to say one more thing to break. Yep, that's right. right. <laughs> yep. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, let's move on. If that's okay, if it's okay, let's move on to the park now. Uh, as uh, Os was suggesting, I th I think what we were hearing on last Wednesday was uh, that uh, concept one was the favorite, or at least had the basics of what we were looking for. Right. Yeah. If I could find it here. There we yeah. go. I like it. I agree. Yeah. I I I don't think I ever heard anybody suggest anything else, but no. I mean the one thing 
they'll they'll probably cost that thing out as X bucks. Um, if it came down to maybe only bu building the middle third and then doing something simpler on the ends that could be added to it yeah. sometime. We could we could suggest a, an alternate there, but I think the cost it out right now. If it's built like that, it's on a linear basis per fifty feet or something. It, it wouldn't be far off the length of it. And if we could incorporate the living shoreline down here, like oh yeah, I was talking about. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Shade is important. You've got to have shade in the summer. It gets pretty hot out there. Mm -hmm. I, I vote for option one. Yep. Okay. Good. Right. Consensus. Yep. yep. Okay. And with uh, the provision that um, enhanced living shoreline, natural vegetation, and use mm -hmm. moisture shells where possible. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And. Uh, what did you have in mind, uh, George, for number H or letter H, underground utilities? Oh, oh, it was just to, uh, when we talked about that, there was some talk about uh, concern of um, uh, what do you do if you run underground to the buildings? They're going to have to change out their electrical system inside. Um, I mean, that, that whole thing is sort of a project unto itself. If everything else is over budget, that may probably have to go. But I think uh, I talked to Jan briefly, and I think he was under the impression that if you didn't, if you just changed it out on coming from overhead to coming on, up the building to the meter and didn't do anything inside, you probably wouldn't have a problem. If you get, went in and actually put a new electric panel in there, that's what might trip you up to uh, require something. But I think the reality is. Where the restroom is, is one big pole that's got overhead connectors into a bunch of those buildings. And I think we're proposing to put a new pole there. And if you had underground coming up the pole, you could keep the overheads from the pole over. You just come up the pole. And uh, I'm not sure there's really anything to discuss. Uh, I have a feeling everybody would probably like to have the, the overhead wires where possible done away with. Um, now, time now to to throw that in. The cost of that, you know, is not going to be insignificant. You got to have you got to have separate um, handholds for telephone, electric, and cable being probably separate, whole separate uh, by themselves. Um, that'll, I guess, Tidewater and CMP would have to weigh in on that. I think I think Wright Pierce had a cost in their in their park you know, parking lot improvements. I don't know whether it was just uh, thrown in there or what thought went into it. They have a conduit in there. Oh yeah, there's separate conduits for um, you know power, telephone, and cable. Um, and every so often you got to have a like a a manway that you can get in and and deal with the connections. Um, you know, they've got that shown, I think, on their parking lot plan. I'm not sure there's anything really to say other than keep it in there and put a cost against it. Mm -hmm. Pass? Um, I'm going to go back a second. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, drawing number two, concept number two, that has uh, two parking spaces taken and has a, um, yeah, I, I, if you look at the center park, yeah, you've got your cursor on it. Um, do we want that in concept number one, as opposed to, I, I think that's, uh, I think that we should have that conversation about whether we want that central walkway or not. Well, you I'm need torn. something, to, I, you I need something myself... to prevent a car from parking there, so. Yeah, and I think they probably assumed it was gonna be in concept one, they just didn't draw it there. Um, well, I understand that, George. I just want to, oh, okay. I was wondering how the whole group feels about that. Yeah, I, I agree with you as that. Yeah. Look, that, they, they said that they'll, they'll gain another parking place on the east end, at least there by the wall. So 
I don't know how many spaces will be lost overall, but it's only one or two. I mean, there's there's three there's three lost, you know, with what they've shown, two in the middle and one on the south side. And then and two the, two regained, they said, at the east end. Yeah, yeah. The uh, committee didn't want to put a walkway through here previously. So there's a change of heart with regard to, to this piece here or not. You said they did or didn't? They well, there certainly was concern want, about it, taking yeah, parking space. Yeah, lost the parking spaces, so yeah. exactly. For me, the concern is this park becomes a feature of the town and the downtown. And we want it to be accessible from the downtown. And we want to probably even want to brag about it. So if we do, if we do that, if we, if that's the way we feel about it, then we should have a, we should announce it and have a way to it there into the middle. And I don't know what that all entails here in terms of design, but this is why I'm raising the, why I think we need to have this conversation. The marked walkways also give us a, a, a little bit of a safety element. Mm -hmm. Make sure that the pedestrians have got a reasonable place to, to go without having to dodge around cars. Yeah, I certainly feel it, it should be incorporated. I mean, as, as part of the whole walkway system that is part of the project. Yeah, Matt, could you swing back up to one again for a second? Concept one, what did what did they draw there? Mm, can't remember. Two two parking places. But what what did they draw by the gate itself? Oh, it looks like they they extended it out a little bit here. So, yeah. Yeah, they into they, the, they, the two parking places. And then they, they didn't indicate anything in the middle, but uh, the assumption is, is that if you're gonna do that, you've really gotta have a pathway that, that says people and not cars. Yeah, up through the middle. Yeah. And they said something about little stanchions or something to keep cars, give them some protection, so. Yeah. So my memory's failing me. We, we may have had this conversation once long ago, but. Is Taco Alley committed to being open for cars to travel, or can we make that a pedestrian way? We have uh, previously, way back in 2012, we got an easement from the people who own that property, um, the Simmons, uh, to make that a, a walkway. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jenny is, I thought. Yeah. is a, a villain who is going to be okay. um, firming that up with them. We had also decided on doing um, a disability access ramp alongside the Taco Alley building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I it, ho yeah, Hopefully it's going to meet ADA requirements or we're going to be, you know, we're not going to be in compliance with the law. The concern, of course, there is the slope. The pitch. Well, I don't. I don't think you you have to make that alleyway handicap accessible. I mean, there's other ways to get in the park, and most probably somebody is. Uh, you know, there's no way you're going to make that slope work. It's just no, but we had talked about it with guardrails or handrails. Well, you can do that. You can do yeah. that, but it's still going to be too too steep. Okay. But I know that we had talked about the distance. So if we were coming in around the west or the east side, it'd be more challenging, which was why we were paying particular attention to making it ADA friendly around Taco Alley. But also in the middle where the uh, two parking spots are uh, going to be eliminated. And did somebody say something about stanchions? But then isn't that going to be a handicap to snow plowing? Well, that's certainly something that needs to be, uh, you know, addressed for sure. Yeah, I, I don't think we want a area up here for even if we put a pedestrian pathway, we, we don't want it raised. We want something that the plows can right. have free mm -hmm. access to. 
I mean, there's materials you could make for that, whether it's pavers or whatever that'll delineate the walkway, make it easy to drive over. Yeah. But in any case, that whole walkway needs to be put in as a X dollars and how it's done will be in the next phase. <clears throat> That's what I see in it. Okay. Um, and then uh, you know, the, well, I'll put together a, a list of uh, follow-up items for Wright Pierce and, and MMI or LS, L, R, L or SLR, L, R, whatever they Is are. It SLR, that's SLR, SLR. I, I can't, I got to think of sea level rise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. And then, so a set schedules for cost estimates. George, you want to explain that a little bit? Well, I was just, uh, you know, I think um, what we need to do is to decide or at least recommend and let them come back in terms of what's a reasonable schedule for them to come up with their cost estimates and wrap this, this phase up because, uh, you know, it's, you know, once, once that's done, then we've got to wrestle with, okay, this is how much it's going to cost. What do we do now? What priorities do we put on things and uh, that whole thing? And so that, and there's going to have to be, uh, you know, probably a, a town presentation too to the general populace before it goes into working drawings. I don't know how you guys see that process work. Definitely needs a little more wider look than just the committee. So I, I think what we need to do is ask them what what's a reasonable time frame and let them commit to it and we can agree or say, look, you got to move faster. There's no point at this point in rushing the thing to the point that they've got costs that really haven't been well thought out. And they may have already done this for a lot of it. I don't know how, how they've been working on it. Okay. Any other, any other questions or comments? I've got a couple of things on my mind. Um, just because we've labored over some notions in the past, I think it's a mistake to just abandon them altogether. I think we should always keep some, you know, there's some potential in, in Misery Gulch at some point that space might become pretty useful. But going back to, I think it was 2012, you know, we had a lot of conversations and a lot of talk, and I personally did a hell of a lot of work uh, researching um, the shipbuilding history in Damascata. And although we've got away from the whole boardwalk idea and all that sort of thing, but I've come up with what I think is a sort of in our face all the time solution to at least representing the Ocean Herald, which was something like 250 feet long, the biggest thing ever built in Damascata. It was, um, you know, three-masted ship and pretty hefty. Now, if you look at the, uh, I don't know if some of you must be familiar with the uh, main marine museum down at Bath. Um, they have a skeletal representation of the Wyoming, which was the biggest wooden ship ever built. Um, pretty impressive. And it's not exactly stealing their idea because a lot of ship skeletons have been put together, but we could do a modified version of that where we have a kind of a, um, you know, ship's bow piece with a big long spinnaker boom sticking out on one end toward the launch ramp. This would be centered on that center gateway. And then a stern piece and the standing up where people can see it, but nowhere near as high as they've done it down in Bath. I mean, the park itself or the wall could basically be thought of as a deck level on this ship. And I think it should be painted an interesting color. So it's kind of exciting to look at as you approach the waterfront. And, uh, you know, George and I've discussed this a little bit. He says, well, this might have to 
involve, you know, raising private money to do something like that, and that might be true. But I think I think we should make this space exciting, just not just because it's a place to sit down under a tree, but commemorating something that really put Damascata and at the same time Newcastle on the map. I mean. This was a very important shipbuilding area and uh, it, pretty impressive. And I think we ought to keep that in mind. I think it's worth mentioning to all the engineers and everything so they know we've got it on our minds. And the way I see it, it would just be a few holes would have to be punched to get the, the pipes, the posts, or whatever they're gonna support these things. Um, that's my thinking. As you're talking, Barnaby, I can envision starting at the bow and walking along the park to the stern so that you can get a sense of what it was like to walk the deck of the ship. Yeah. Well, this could be like a living history uh, experiment that you could propose to people visiting the park. Yeah, and there'd be room in the bow section where you could have um, some information um, panels and so forth. Um, but instead of painting it white, I had this idea of painting it something a little more exciting, like Chinese red, which is a really wonderful warm red color that's, that's got some symbolism to it. And if that's too shocking, just think what happened with the Golden Gate Bridge, which uh, was supposed to be just primer. And they decided they liked it so much they kept it that way. But I, that's just an image I've got in my mind. And I think it's worth hanging on to as we talk about all the rest of this. So you're proposing the color of your suspenders? Well, those aren't Chinese red. They're firecracker red to match my Jeep. <laughs> Can you see the Wyoming here? Yeah. 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 Um, and we don't need all those flagpoles. Maybe the flagpoles are the masts. I know that. Yeah. But we don't have room for three big uh, Okay. If you're going to uh -oh, go to play, here comes ball, Haas. <laughs> uh, some of you know what I'm going to say now. You open the door. Oh, don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, let me let me say it. You yourself, I can't do it. There's the if we had a, one flagpole in the park. My proposal is that that flagpole be the size of the mizzen mast of the Ocean Herald, because the flag from the Ocean Herald flew from a spar from the mizzen mast. And if we had that flagpole at size with a flag at size hanging from it, people would never forget Damascata. That was one of the original boardwalk ideas. Yeah, that's right. right. I, I put it up back then, Ron. You'd have to have a blinking light on the top of it. <laughs> well, the well, point is the... this. The point is this. What inspired me to even suggest this back then Back in the 50s, 60s, when my kids were under 10 years old, we'd come to Maine. And we hadn't arrived. We, we hadn't arrived in their minds until they seen the Luther and the Hesper. How many of you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. The Luther and the Hesper, those two ships rotting in Wiscasset. All right. Well, what if the future generations know they've arrived in Damascata because they can see the mizzen mast of the Ocean Herald. I think we ought to give this a rest. <laughs> yeah, we, we could talk about this all night. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you, guys are gonna get a, you guys are going to get an email from me, which shows a couple pictures I put together just for the concept, because it seems to me that it's rather inexpensive to build a foundation for such a flagpole when you're putting in the seawall and then worry about raising the money five or 10 years from now for the flagpole. So I just so you know, I'm going to put I'm going to float that out there with a couple pictures to give you the concept as I see it. Thank you. Good. OK, the uh, the consultants had uh, posed another question for us. And Matt, can you put up number two? I think we need to provide, provide guidance. The option two on the park. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um, I'll find it here. Just a sec.
Hey, Ron, this is Dick. While we're waiting, someday would you email me your new email address down there? Email address is the same. It bounces back at me when I try to send anything. Really? Okay. Yeah, you're in a different country, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need put... shots to get here. Ron, Ron, I take that back. Maybe today you do, but... Ron? Yes. Copy, copy me on that email. Okay, uh -huh. you just sent me an email, and I got you. I got it. But I'll send it to you too, yes. Are you living there year round, Ron? Yes, I am. Oh, I didn't know that. Can't you tell by the shape of the goatee he's from Florida? <laughs> it's on my screen. I just got to pop it up here. see that or no yes oh you can oh i see it well i see an email yeah there's a email it says matt here's a copy <laughs> okay well i'm looking at it <laughs> you picked the wrong window to share i'm guessing Okay, yeah, you're right. There. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. Good. Okay, number two. Okay, if you could enlarge that a little bit. They suggested that uh, because that would consume a couple of parking spaces, they suggested on the left side converting some, I think they're boat trailer spaces to passenger car spaces. And you see where I'm looking, I think it says number, where number two, is that the number? Uh, right there, yeah. What's that number? Two, two. 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 yeah. Two. So, and I think they also said they thought they could squeeze a parking space all the way uh, to the right. Um, but that, I think the, the key one is what the committee feels about spaces on number two, which I think are now boat trailer parking. Yeah, know. and not, not only that, Bob, but that's where they set the crane up to put mass on boat that they're launching. Okay, so they wanted some oh. action on that. So doesn't, sounds the state, like, doesn't the state require us, doesn't the state require us to maintain a minimum number of boat spaces? Oh, yes. I don't know if those spaces that we have labeled there are part of the count. I can't remember if there's 20. I think there's a certain amount of double spaces for trailer parking. And then we have a certain number for just boaters. Boater. Yeah, we've got, we do have, I uh, hate to say it, but there is some flexibility there. We're not required to have these, but they, they strongly encouraged us and at the time that the launch was redone um at the document that we had those spaces available mm -hmm. and right well, here it sounds like it sounds like we can't uh convert those but i mean that was a question that was kind of left hanging yeah i, I think i think yeah you're right I, unless we unless we uh, put those in the expanded the main parking but the idea there was to actually Use, use the parking that we have that we're taking away by the walkway and, and maybe consider putting at least one over there. 
So I don't, I don't know if that that's if you have if you have vehicles there and uh, uh, Paul Cunningham comes with his crane truck to uh, put a mast in a sailboat that he's launching, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Okay, so I guess, uh, Matt, the, that's another thing we tell the consultant, not to touch those. Mm -hmm. and the, the other thing we've done here, although last year our companies didn't take advantage of this, but we said if you give us a couple days notice, we can we can cone these off for tour buses. Uh -huh. Well, what, what about also having to give notice when you're going to put a, a mast on a ship so that you're not holding it open eternally for that possibility. I think he just gets, well, it's, it doesn't say this is for um, setting up your, your boats. He, right. he, he's just taking his chances when he gets there. Um, that they'll be open. Gentlemen, I've got another meeting coming up. And Sherry, uh -huh. well, it's, uh, I'm I'm going to need to bow it's a, out. It's it's a it's an hour and a half. I think probably have That's we covered we'll all the stuff that we need to. Yeah, I'm. Yep. So I'm, great. I, I'm satisfied. Thank you, Dick. Always glad to see you guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Have you a will. good evening. Um, hey, Dick. We'll follow up with uh, a list of of the conclusions that we reached today, and uh, I'll I'll send that to all of you first. You can edit it as you'd like, and then we'll prepare it for right peers. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. All right. Okay. See you Bye, later. Ron. I'll see you in the email, Haas. <laughs>